we have um, such an important topic today, more people coming into the waiting room, um, uh, from the waiting room into our meeting room, which is fantastic. And uh, uh, we are in the process of uh, streaming on Facebook Live. And so really looking forward to this conversation. Um, and as soon as I get a thumbs up from Lauren that we are on Facebook Live, then we'll be ready to get started. Um, so please, um, thank you folks. I see a lot of great hellos in the chat. That's fantastic. We have um, many other lawmakers who are tuning in today and their staff. Um, I also know we have um, members from the different cities um, across um, the state as well. So that is fantastic. Um, and it looks like we're having a little bit of uh, trouble logging into our Facebook Live. And so, um, you know, I think that we are going to probably go ahead and get started just for the sake of time. Um, as Lauren works to troubleshoot it, we are recording. So if we are um, late to getting on to Facebook Live, we will um, uh, be able to post the recording as well. Um, so with that said, I want us to get started because this is such an important conversation um, focused on housing and COVID-19, but specifically zooming in onto uh, the most recent moratorium um, here in the state of Florida that the governor renewed um, about two weeks ago that really isn't a moratorium on evictions or foreclosures. So we're going to talk about that today. Before we get started, I want to toss it to both of our interpreters. Um, uh, we are proud to be offering language services uh, for today's conversation, both in Spanish and Creole. Um, and so please uh, join me in welcoming uh, for MARV Language Services, Rose and Maria, who are going to speak in, in Creole and Spanish um, to our viewers to make sure folks know about the language line. Bonsoir, bonjour tout le monde. Donc, nom est Rose de Mab Language Services. Et donc, je dis à nous pour aller by interprétation dans la langue que nous capables de comprendre, pour capable de bien participer, pour bon information que nous pouvons recevoir dans la communauté en sous affaire CAI. Et donc, tant pis si que nous t'arrivons à entendre toutes tes informations ça, et puis pour nous participer en créole haïtien, tant pis n'a pris les numéros 305 901 26 92. Et là, nous rentrons sous appel là, tant pis, mettez micro nous sous silence pour nous capables pas gain interruption. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rose from More Language Services and my colleague uh, Maria and Angelica. Um, we will be offering uh, interpretation in Haitian Creole and Spanish. And we would like to do that because we will be getting a lot of wonderful information about um, about housing um, during the COVID time. And so we would like for you to please call the interpretation line. The number to call if you'd like to listen in your language in Haitian Creole will be 305-901-2692. If you'd like to listen in Spanish, please dial 786-665-8802. We would like for you to please remember as you enter the call to mute your line so that we have less interruption as possible. Thank you. And now we'll pass the mic to my colleague, Maria Angelica. Buenos días, mi nombre es Maria Angelica y hoy estaré ofreciendo interpretación en español con Marb Language Services. Mi colega Rose está ofreciendo interpretación en criollo haitiano para asegurarnos a que todos tengamos acceso a esta información importante que se va a compartir hoy, eh, sin importar el idioma que decidamos eh, hablar. Eh, si ustedes quieren conectarse a la línea de interpretación en español, por favor llamen al número 786-665-8802. También la pusimos en el chat del Zoom y la pondremos en el chat del Facebook Live. Eh, muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria um, and Rose. And we also... Um, should be having closed captioning uh, provided by UN as well. So we're doing our best to make sure that uh, this event is accessible to folks of, of different languages who face different barriers. And so 
um, thank you so much for being a part of this. Um, and so uh, with that said, we are going to um, dive into introducing our three guest speakers that are with us today. Um, each are incredible attorneys who are experts on the issue of tenants' rights and housing in Florida. So when I say your name, if you could just give folks a wave so they know um, who you are. So we have uh, Sean Rowley. Um, he has been a tenant rights attorney in Miami for 14 years. He currently serves as the advocacy director for the tenant rights unit at Legal Services of Greater Miami. Thank you so much for being here, Sean. Thanks for having uh, me. It's a pleasure. We have uh, Jay Mobley. Jay is the senior housing and consumer debt attorney at the Legal Aid Society of the Orange County Bar Association, where I am, where for the past seven years, he has dealt with landlord tenant disputes, evictions, and consumer debt litigation. Jay serves on the Florida Bar Public Interest Law Sections Executive Committee and on the Florida Bar Military Affairs Committee. So thank you so much, Jay, for being here. My pleasure. And then finally, we have James uh, Koleski Jr., who has served as the president and CEO of Jacksonville Area Legal Aid since December of 2012. After graduating from UC Berkeley and the University of San Francisco School of Law, Jim moved to Florida where he served as an assistant state attorney in the fourth judicial circuit from 1989 to 1996 before transitioning into a civil trial practice. And he has tried more than 60 jury, jury trials to verdict. And so thank you, James, for also joining us today. Thank you for having me. So we're gonna dive right into the conversation. I already see questions in the chat as well. And I think the biggest question that folks have is about the current moratorium in Florida. Because though the governor said he renewed the moratorium on evictions and foreclosures, I know that we've seen in, in our district, evictions already start to be filed. And there's a great deal of confusion, it seems that the headlines on these issues were not accurate to what was actually happening. And so I wonder if we could start the conversation with what are these changes that we're seeing in Florida? Um, and we can clarify the confusion compared to what folks are reading in the news compared to what was actually happening on the ground. So Anna, thank you so much for, for having us today. And I'll, and I'll uh, I guess, start with this one and, and then Jay and Sean can chime in. Part of why we're so interested in participating is to alleviate the confusion that you talk about. The headlines read moratorium, but I think we're all in agreement that there is no functioning eviction moratorium in Florida as of August 1. What the last order from the governor did was it allowed all evictions to restart, including evictions for non-payment of rent, but it gave the tenants a very important defense, confirming that they could not be evicted through the final act, which is called a writ. They could not be evicted through the use of that final act where the sheriff stands by while the writ is being served and your belongings are physically moved out. If you can prove that the reason for the non-payment is a loss of income due to COVID-19. So what we all are focused on is sharing that information with tenants all across Florida so that they can be prepared to respond to the eviction complaint once it's filed. They must respond. They should not simply read the papers and think that there's a moratorium that overlaps or overcomes the requirement to respond to that eviction complaint. Thank you, Jim. Jay and Sean, do you want to add more to that as well? Um, sure, I'll just chime in. Um, I, and I agree with everything that Jim said. Um, the executive order um, suspends final action at the conclusion of a case, but it, the order doesn't really um, define exactly what that means. I mean, our interpretation of it is going to be that court should not be entering final judgments. Uh, Jim mentioned writs, and, and, um, but I mean, our, we are gonna argue that court should not be entering final judgments of eviction as well. Um, it, it also says, it also defines specifically, uh, you're protected if you're adversely affected by, economically by COVID-19. So the tenants are now gonna have that obligation, like Jim said, to demonstrate that they were adversely effect, affected, which is loss of employment, loss of income, business income, 
or any other economic impact by COVID-19. So it's gonna be very important to have documentation to present to the court or testimony to the court as to why you're still adversely impacted. Because like Jim said, uh, the very important defense that's still there is that the rent is not considered to be due uh, uh, until you are no longer adversely impacted by COVID-19. So that's gonna be very important for tenants to file answers and motions to determine rent to assert that the rent is not due until they're no longer adversely impacted. As long as that order is still in effect, John. So the, yes. the current extension expires again the end of this month. So not right. to interrupt, but everything you just said only lasts until the end of August. Correct. That's correct. Yeah, I would add to that. I agree with all of it. But one of the things is how each jurisdiction interprets the executive order. Um, as you said, there's the difference of, is it the writ or is it the final judgment uh, of eviction? Um, I know different jurisdictions are gonna handle it different ways. So it's very important that folks know what's happening in their area, not across the state, because it may be completely different in their court system. Well, and, and let's, and I, I, see, I see some good questions from the chat, I'm gonna lift up soon specific to this, but let's talk about that a little bit more because I know that we have, we have some attorneys who are tuning in. We also have some non-attorneys who are tuning in, right? So, um, and I also wanna thank members of the Florida Bar Foundation for helping to pull this together and for each one of you for being here because this information is so invaluable. But when we're talking to someone that was just given an eviction notice, could you walk through you know, what that step-by-step -step process looks like while we're in this moratorium, let's say you got that three-day eviction notice on your door and then a five-day eviction notice, what, what should you do next? I'll so, start off with, oh, go oh, ahead, Jim. No, go ahead, Jay. So basically, I back up a step before that. If you think you're covered under the moratorium, you should be getting your documents together now so that you don't have just a five day window to you know, prove that you're impacted financially by COVID. Get your severance letters, get anything you can as proof because you're gonna to need to show the court that. So once you get your three day notice from the landlord, you have that three days to either catch up in the rent or the landlord gets to file the eviction action. Once the eviction action is filed in court, you're gonna be served by the sheriff or a private process server They'll come to your house. They'll try to make personal service twice, six hours apart. If they can't reach you, they're going to tape it to your front door. Uh, that's personal service or that is sufficient service in Florida. Don't ignore the paperwork. Read it immediately. Know that you're on a five-day clock. You don't count the day you're served, weekends or holidays, court holidays, but you have a five-day window to complete an answer form in writing Put all of your proof, your letter of severance, anything you can you know, gather, and file the answer and the motion to determine rent. Um, Jim's got an excellent tool that we're using around the state to build that answer for you online. We'll talk about that later. But get your answer into the clerk within that five days. Ask for that motion to determine rent and say, I'm covered under the executive order. Hopefully when you get in front of the judge in that motion to determine rent hearing, uh, the hearing it's triggered, you're gonna be able to say, look, here's my severance letter. I'm affected, I lost my wages or my husband lost my wages, I lost wages. As long as that judge agrees, they're gonna to toll the eviction for some amount of time. There's debate as to whether it's through September 1st, the end of the moratorium whether it's uh, you know, 30 days later, a case management conference or something. I think each jurisdiction may handle it slightly differently, but you will not be evicted as long as the judge agrees that you're covered at that hearing under the executive order. And each do we us know, a, I'm sorry, sorry. No, I just wanted to sorry, ask, do you know if unemployment benefits impact the definition of adverse impact? You know, if I'm getting unemployment benefits, is, can I, can I still demonstrate a loss of income or do we know if judges are considering unemployment as, as part of that? I think the landlords are certainly gonna make the argument that it shouldn't apply. Okay. I mean, the order does say loss realized during the uh, economic crisis. So if you lost employment and lost income, I think there's a good argument to say that 
you're adversely economic impact uh, adversely economically impacted if you're if you lost your job and you're not back to work yet right especially knowing that unemployment benefits there's so many other costs that come with living right you have rent to pay other bills to pay utilities to pay and i'm sure when folks are looking at their budget and deciding what can i pay right now medical bills might be a more of an urgency right now than than their rent unfortunately just with the nature of things i know um um, Jim, you're going to add more. I'm sorry about that. No, I was going to point out that each of our, each of the legal aid organizations around the state, coordinated through the Bar Foundation, have explanations of what Jay just talked about. So, what he mentioned is a great resource and a great summary of how the process works. But all of the legal aids make a strong focus on our websites of educating folks just on these very basic concepts. When you get the notice. When you get the summons, you've got five days to respond with your answer and affirmative defenses and motion to determine rent. And in this case, the motion to determine rent is what you're arguing is the reason why you don't have to deposit the money into the court registry because as you know, Florida is a pay to play state and we require tenants to deposit the rent in order to make any defense of any kind, whatever it is, regardless of whether a tree's come through your roof or not. But each of the legal aid websites have this information uh, and we'll get to the form builder that, that legal aid has, uh, the JALA has built uh, later on in the discussion. But all of the websites are, are safe places for folks to turn all over the state. That's fantastic. And, and actually one of the questions in the chat is from Ben, who's a local attorney who works with members of our Brazilian community. And Ben is asking, you know, does the pay to play statue apply um, and I, I think, you know, with the moratorium, if, if you can just di display an adverse impact, then the pay to play does not apply, correct? Right, but that's your burden. What we're trying to make clear is that the latest order that expires the end of this month requires the tenant to make that statement and, as Jay highlighted, make that showing. So collect your financial records now, and then the judge would have to find that you do not have to deposit the rent because you've made that showing. So it's not automatic. You must make the showing and then you may be relieved from the obligation to deposit rent while the case is still pending. Correct. And well, that brings me, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Sean. I was just gonna mention one more thing. We've been talking um, about the statewide eviction moratorium, which is the main protection. There is also the CARES Act the protection in, in the CARES Act, which applies to about 30% of renters in the United States, if you live in subsidized housing or if your landlord had a federally backed mortgage. Now that moratorium did expire at the uh, around July 25th, but if you are covered under that moratorium, you still have a good number of protections. For example, your landlord's required to give a 30 day notice uh, rather than the normal three, uh, three day notice. Also, your landlord is not allowed to charge any late fees that happened between March 27th and July 25th. So you're gonna to wanna to also look at, to, at whether or not you're covered under the CARES Act. And this also reminds me of um, President Trump's recent executive orders. Um, my interpretation is that they really don't make much of an impact because they were recommendations, not requirements. Am, am I accurate in, in that interpretation? I think we usually use the interpretation of no impact as opposed to not much of an impact. So <laughs> uh, again, it's part of why what you're doing today is so helpful and, and thank you for doing it because when folks hear that there's a federal moratorium, I received a a, uh, an email from one of the largest insurance brokers in the country on their newsletter. And they were sending it to me because they wanted to share with me the fact of the federal moratorium. And I had to respond back and say, this is part of what we're combating against. We're trying to make sure folks understand that the executive order, uh, in fact, does not affect a single eviction in the state. And the federal moratorium that Sean just spoke about that expired the end of July was not continued in the recent executive order from the president. So please pay attention to the court proceedings that you may be going through because the president's order does not affect that. Right. But we've actually already had several folks call our office and say, 
hey, I know the executive order was signed. That should stop my eviction, right? And we have to, you know, tell them, no, it has no impact on what's going to happen with your eviction. Right, right. Yep. It, it does vert, it does nothing like uh, Jay and Jim said. One statement in the executive order does state that it's the policy of the United States to currently minimize evictions whenever possible. So that language could be helpful if we get into nuanced uh, arguments about how extensive the CARES Act moratorium is. That's language that might be helpful, but it provides no new substantive rights whatsoever. Okay. Well, and this brings me to our next question. Um, we talked about this a little bit, but you know, Florida is a big state, 67 counties, 67 clerks, and the direction from the governor is not a, it's not a blanket requirement when it comes to the specific operations of how clerks are interpreting the moratorium. And I know that every circuit seems to be taking a different approach. And I was wondering, since you three are each located across the state, to maybe speak about administrative orders locally to you and how those are helping Floridians versus, um, you know, kind of keeping things as, as generic as possible. And maybe Sean, I know with Miami having some specific administrative orders, maybe you could get us started. Sure, absolutely. So I mentioned the CARES Act moratorium, and if you're in private housing, you're covered under that if your landlord has a federally backed mortgage. Now, obviously, tenants aren't going to know whether or not their landlord has that kind of mortgage without a, a lot of searching. So in our judicial circuit, which is in Miami, and other circuits have it as well, in every non-payment of rent eviction that is filed, the landlord is required to file an affidavit under penalty of perjury uh, uh, certifying whether or not they are covered under the CARES Act. That's an important protection because it will help people determine if they're covered under the CARES Act and it's, and it's one more step the landlord has to take in order to fulfill the eviction. Um, in Miami, we also were fortunate to uh, that our Sheriff's Department is not issuing, uh, executing any writs of possession for any evictions at all uh, um, and that's been in place since March when there's been a state of emergency. So that's a couple things uh, specific to Miami. Uh, in Orange County, we don't have an uh, admin order right now. Um, so our clerks are operating as normal, just like they would have last year this time. Um, the only change is now we have the defense of the tenant that we just discussed about. But otherwise, cases are being processed as normal. One of the folks in your chat pointed out the Schimberg Center website. All of our websites also link to the tools that tenants can search on to see if their uh, multifamily housing has a federally backed mortgage. Then the recent action by Fannie and Freddie makes it mandatory that if your landlord has a federally backed mortgage and is in a forbearance, in other words, your landlord is not paying his or her mortgage on your rental property, they must affirmatively tell you as the tenant so that you're aware of these additional protections, as Jay mentioned, otherwise tenants won't know that. In the Fourth Circuit, uh, which is Duval, Clay, and Nassau, our judges have really been getting ready for this for some time. So we do have the affidavit in place that Sean talked about where the landlord has to affirmatively allege that they're not covered by the CARES Act. And then we also have an additional administrative order in, in place that requires the landlord, even if the eviction was filed pre-beginning of the moratoriums, to provide the court with a status conference and bring the court up to date. So there are some, some significant measures that our local county judges have been taking uh, during this abeyance to get ready for last week or get ready for August 1st. You know, I think it may be good advice and we've been sharing it with tenants here. Um, as you pointed out, Jim, there's, there's no way for the tenant to know really or realistically that they are CARES Act covered. So we've been telling them if you get a hearing of any kind in front of the judge or in your filings when you do your answer, you know, assert that I think I'm covered under the CARES Act, but I don't have the ability to prove that. Would the court inquire as to whether the landlord says they're covered or not? Um, right. And Jay mentioned a little while ago the tool that Jacksonville Area Legal Aid built with help from housing lawyers all around the state. It's at floridaevictionhelp.org. 
and it includes that CARES Act defense that Jay just mentioned. I don't know if I'm covered. I'm asking the court to inquire. I do know that I'm covered. I'm asserting that as a defense. It also includes the affirmative defense, which is the response, right? An affirmative defense is when somebody sues you, this is what you say back. It also includes the defense that provides, that's provided by the governor's order where you're alleging or advising the court that you have an income loss due to COVID-19. So that's all at floridaevictionhelp.org. Again, we use this abeyance time to build that tool so that folks all over the state can have the help in walking through the written response that they have to file in court to their eviction lawsuit. And have we seen any actual cases be determined and adjudicated yet based on the current moratorium or is it still, could you, could you share more about cases we have seen? Well, there were, there were counties that were already proceeding as if they were not covered by the pre-August 1 moratorium. And so there are counties all over the state where non-payment evictions were already being processed in Jacksonville, we've seen well over 350 evictions being filed since August 1. So those haven't processed yet, but evictions that were already filed for non-pay that were held, those have restarted. And if the tenant had already defaulted or did default, those writs are being issued and executed by the local sheriffs. We have litigated a couple cases where landlords have just filed in violation of the moratorium. There's really been only two cases that have gone to court. The landlord's attorney dismissed the eviction before, right before the hearing. And in another instance, the landlord's attorney attempted to move forward with the eviction and the case was um, dismissed. But there hasn't been a lot of, um, just to give you a ba some basic data in terms of some success of the moratorium in Miami, between April and July, we had a little more than a thousand evictions filed. Um, now that sounds like a high number, but compared to two years ago, those same four months, we had 5,800 evictions filed. So on the whole, the moratorium has been somewhat of a success. I don't want to say it's great, but it's been right. a lot better than what we would have had. Right. In Orange County, I think we had around 500 cases that were filed during the moratorium. Luckily, at that time, we had an administrative order from our chief judge that and the clerk and sheriff, they all agreed, nothing moves. So it was electronically filed, but no service process was issued. The sheriff wasn't delivering anything. But as Jim pointed out, those are in the hopper and they're ready to go and they're being issued now. So we're expecting, you know, a flood of filings. And Sean, could you talk a little more about illegal lockouts and just some of the other tactics we've seen and <clears throat> you know, that some landlords have tried and just from a legal perspective too, you know, I'm sure someone do in that situation. So yeah, we have seen some instances where landlords are getting frustrated that they can't move quickly enough and they're taking matters into their own hands by engaging in prohibited practices, which usually include shutting off the water or shutting off the electric or changing the locks and locking people out. Uh, that is clearly illegal in Florida. Uh, uh, you can get an injunction to have those services restored or get access to the unit. Additionally, uh, the Florida statute 8367 allows tenants to get damages, statutory damages of three times the monthly rent for each time the landlord does that. It's intended to be punitive. So if, you know, if the landlord shuts off your electric and your rent is $1,000 a month, you should get $3,000 in damages. If they shut off the electric and the water, that, that, that should be $6,000 in damages. Now, you're gonna need to file your case and, and pursue it and, and that takes time, but it's, it's the illegal lockouts and, and prohibited practices are clearly illegal in Florida. Got it, thank you, Sean. It's the 12.30 mark, so we're gonna start taking some of our pre-submitted questions and also um, some more great questions in the chat as well. Uh, before we do that, in case there are folks who have to hop off at some point, I just wanted to lift up um, the support of the Florida Bar Foundation and the pro bono legal community, um, really elevating the work of legal aid because the folks you're hearing from right now are some of our frontline advocates and there are many, many more who are with us right now, but also across the state working. And so 
Um, I don't know who wants to maybe just, I know, um, Jim, you seem like the perfect person just to kind of lift up the website for um, legal aid services. And, and I know eligibility can look different for every part of the state, but maybe just give folks that information now as we begin the pre-submitted questions. Sure. So the Florida Bar Foundation is a great resource. Google them, go to the website, the floridabarfoundation.org. They have the connectivity to all of the legal aids across the state. We're structured in these seven giant regions. And without getting too much into the weeds, there's complementary services depending upon where you live. But all of that is coordinated through the work of the Florida Bar Foundation, uh, which sits in your, its headquarters sit in, in Orlando or in Maitland. So we, we truly appreciate their support. We appreciate the connectivity. They, in turn, host a number of the statewide websites. Uh, they link to the FloridaEvictionHelp.org site that we've built. But that's sort of the umbrella or network organization that ties us all together throughout the state and helps us all provide levels of service throughout the state, despite the fact that we live in 67 different counties. Awesome. Thank you, Jim. So going to our pre-submitted questions, as a reminder, these were questions that we received when folks were RFCPing for the event. There are many. We'll do our best to get through as much as we can. Um, but I hope so far, you know, folks are, have been getting a lot of good information um, to be your own advocate, knowing that there is a huge responsibility on tenants right now to protect yourself. And there are organizations like Legal Aid in your community that, that, that can help, like the form builder that Jim already mentioned. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, we really want to make sure that folks feel empowered to protect themselves because that's what's going to take right now to maintain a roof over your head. Um, and so one of our first questions is a, a very common situation I know in, in places like Orlando with roommates and so many, you know, tenants are roommates across the state. Um, if you have been keeping up with your payments, but your roommate has not paid anything, does the court take that into account? Or is it my responsibility to pay the full share or get evicted too? I don't mind taking that one since it's probably a local one for us. Um, it's kind of an old law school answer. It depends. It depends on how your lease is written. Um, here we have UCF locally. So some of those apartments may have provisions where you're only responsible for your portion of the rent. But generally speaking, most leases are what we call jointly and severably liable. Each person is responsible to make sure the payment is made. It doesn't matter whose pocket it's coming out of. If the rent is not made in full, everybody will get evicted. That's the general rule. And again, you got to look to the lease. Um, there's all kinds of provisions. It could be in there. It could help you. Maybe not. And for those moms and dads out there who may have co-signed for their son's college <laughs> dorm room, uh, not speaking about anybody in particular, that's right. something to also be aware of as well, because everything Jay just said also applies to the co-signers or guarantors <clears throat> of that lease. And in the case of many of our college kids who are trying to decide whether to go physically back to their universities right now, uh, that's going to be significant as we move into the college school year. And they will come after co-signers. We've seen a, a rash of those here locally when UCF went virtual. Um, right, so right. It's, it's with any contract. If you co-sign, you're liable. Thank you for that, Jay, by the way. Not that I'm personally listening to that. <laughs> right. <laughs> but that's been a major issue with our college students, a little off topic, but we know many college students, um, you know, learning virtually and have these leases back on their campuses that they weren't able to end. And it's, it's been a nightmare for us too. Um, and so I, I appreciate that and the personal connection, Jim. <laughs> um, our next question is um, a really good one. Are the disabled exempt? And so maybe Sean, if I don't know, I know we were talking about this before we started, but some of the Fair Housing Act and, you know, is there any type of exemptions for those that identify as disabled or even our seniors? Well, it, if the question is about exemption from uh, eviction or needing to move, um, I mean, generally, no. I think that what could, what tenants might be able to do if they are, 
have some sort of condition where they uh, are at a very high risk and are very concerned about moving, I think they could submit a reasonable accommodation request to their landlord to extend the tenancy, base asserting that I'm disabled, I, I will be at great risk of having to move due to my disability, so I would ask that you accommodate me by giving me more time um, since we're in the midst of this, uh, you know, a state of emergency and pandemic. Um, and then if the landlord says, no, uh, I want my unit, you would raise that as a defense in the eviction. But I, um, that's going to be very fact specific. Uh, um, and in terms of what accommodation you're asking for, if you're asking for a little more time, I think courts would be a little more likely to, to grant that than, you know, asking to be able to stay indefinitely. But I, I, you can raise, uh, you can ask for reasonable accommodations based on your disability and raise that as the defense. What Sean's talking about is the intersection of the Fair Housing Act and Florida statute. So again, the legal aid websites will be the intro point to contact folks and learn more about that. There are legal aids across the state that do fair housing work. JALA does fair housing work. Sean's legal aid does fair housing work. Jay's Legal Aid does not do the fair housing work, but they work very closely with their sister legal aid that does. So mm -hmm. Jay would recognize that type of case and obviously triage it and get it over to the appropriate fair housing advocates. Raises a whole host of potential additional protections. But as Sean said, these are defenses, they're responses, as opposed to something that affirmatively prevents some action. Got it. Well, um, taking in a new question, um, this question is another common scenario we've seen where landlords have said they're not going to renew someone's lease um, because they're unemployed. And so, and in some cases we've seen landlords with a, a lease renewal increase people's rent in the middle of a pandemic. Legal, not legal for landlords to do that I think that no court is going to force a, a landowner uh, to enter a new lease. I don't think they, they will do that. Generally speaking, when you enter that contract and it has a, a termination date, you're expected to vacate on that date. Um, so we're seeing a rash of the non-renewals. Um, if you could make a case for retaliatory behavior, on the part of the landlord, you know, you've been living there for six or eight years and never had a problem until this issue came up. You may be able to raise that defense, but again, um, I, I don't think the odds are very good at forcing a landlord to renew a lease. Okay. There's no provision for it in Florida law. And again, yeah. we would be intersecting here with public housing law. So right. uh, the only exception is for certain types of public housing there are some provisions relating to lease renewal and your local legal aid would be the place to turn to for that. Mm -hmm. One thing specific to Miami and I think another, a couple other counties in Florida like Broward are uh, counties that have laws which ban discrimination based on source of income. So if renters are getting a rental assistance to pay the rent um, and the landlords are saying, no, I'm not going to take that, that is probably that could be unlawful under the county uh, law which bans discrimination based on source of income. Also, I would just say that if a tenant has not been able to pay the rent um, and they uh, and the landlord doesn't feel like they can bring a non-payment of rent eviction, so they they serve a notice terminating the tenancy as a month-to-month -month tenancy to try to get, get around the moratorium, I think there would be a, a defense there to say they're subverting the purpose of the moratorium. And that's, that's a defense that I think might be worth trying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and like uh, Jay mentioned very early on, collect your evidence. So we've actually seen some cases where the property management company that was responsible for collecting the rent itself failed during the pandemic, itself failed for economic reasons. And so you have tenants who were trying to pay a major property management company that itself went out of business where they're going to have to provide proof that they at least submitted those payments, especially if that's the reason why the landlord is currently using 
uh, to evict, regardless think, of whether the lease expired or not. I think one of the points we're, we're all hitting at is that every case is fact specific. And that's why it's so important to reach out and speak with an attorney because your case may be different than your neighbors who you assume is exactly situated like you are, but it may be a different, you know, you may have a defense, they don't, vice versa. So it's very important to, to keep the facts, gather all the evidence and be able to explain that story, not only to someone like at Legal Aid who can help you, but to the judge. Right, and right. going forward, Anna, as I think we talked about in, in some of our meetings, there are ideas out there for how to structure this statewide. Colorado has an excellent statewide website where landlords go in one portal and receive CARES Act funding from the state and tenants go in another portal and receive assistance through United Way 211, which is probably also CARES Act funding. So there are ways, uh, the ABA has a number of suggestions as well, but there are ways to, to drop a statewide structure over an emergency and Florida seems to have somewhat of an emergency every fall when hurricane season sit, uh, hit. So hopefully as we move forward, we'll look to some of the stuff Colorado's doing, some of the recommendations from the ABA to try to come up with a state structure that assists both landlords and tenants in the event of a non-payment of rent crisis. Well, and, and I'm seeing some of those ABA recommendations in the chat from Donnie, uh, who's, who is um, with the Florida Bar Foundation, um, you know, lifting up legislative funding for rent payments made to landlords in lieu of evictions, um, which is something Orange County is embarking on uh, potentially with CARES Act dollars and creating a $20 million support fund um, for those that face eviction. The landlord has to consent to the program as well, but it is one of those creative solutions to try to meet the need of the landlord and the tenant. Um, and then another idea too is legislation forbidding landlords from using evictions or forbearances caused by COVID-19 pandemic and rent applications going forward. And as we take some more questions from the chat, I just wanted to lift up many of the pre-submitted questions we had were were fantastic in the sense that they were focused on advocacy. And I know we have a lot of advocates here, whether they're attorneys or community groups. Um, and so perhaps before we wrap up, we can also just try to elevate some of the policy proposals long term and resources, because um, the reality is that Florida has always been a difficult state for renters in the sense that the, the bar is set really pro landlord and anti tenant. Um, the pay for play structure is not common in every state. And I've been proud to file repealers of some of those different laws to try to make it more even. Um, but we know it's a, it's a very difficult environment, even without a pandemic, let alone with one. Um, and so I'm going to lift up another question uh, from the chat that I'm sure is something a lot of people are thinking about too. Um, you know, if you are going through this process with a, with a court, but the governor doesn't renew the moratorium, the current moratorium, uh, you know, before the end of this month, what happens to your case? Is it moot because the moratorium expired or can you still continue to try to seek that protection from the current moratorium? Our, uh, our position is that if a lawsuit was filed in violation of the moratorium, it should be dismissed and they should have to start over because the statute was suspended at the time they filed their cause of action. So we assert they didn't have a valid cause of action and it should be dismissed. Um, some judges are, are going, going to say that, oh, well, we're just gonna wait. And as soon as the moratorium it ends, uh, we're just gonna pick up the case then. Uh, we think that's very unfair because um, it, it allows landlords to uh, kind of cut the line and have a leg up because they violated the moratorium. So mm -hmm. I, I think there are good arguments to say that the cases should be dismissed, but we don't, a lot of- The other side of that argument, um, and I agree with you, they should have been dismissed because the statute was told. But the other side of the argument is if you're successful in getting the first case dismissed and they refile, now the tenant has two evictions on their record, not just one. So it's a double-edged sword. And a lot of tenants that I've spoken with say, no, no, leave it alone. I'd rather have one than two. Right. So, and I was being facetious and saying, we don't know, because part of what we're, we want folks to game plan for is that longer ahead 
process. W what is your long-term game plan? Do you have the ability to stay here? I think your website has been very good at, at pointing out where folks can access the CARES Act funding. The CARES Act funding flows in to 67 counties, 67 different ways, and they're each rolling out rental assistance in different ways. But folks simply have to game plan for September 1 and what their abilities are to proceed as if they don't have the rent. And unfortunately, as Sean indicated, not only are judges not gonna disagree, but in many parts of the state, judges are already not, dis not agreeing with the impact of the moratorium pre-August 1. I think that definitely the ability to claim protection ends on September 1st. So you no longer have that defense to fall back on to file your motion to determine and say I'm impacted so I shouldn't have to pay. So unless there's some other extension, folks are gonna to have to come up with rent money to do the pay to play system September 1st. Right, and that process starts now. What, what I think a number of the social service agencies have found frustratingly is that folks were not applying for resources over these last three or four months because they were reading the headlines. And now is the time. Figure it out, do the math, and, and come up with a, a backup plan or a game plan for September 1, as, as uh, Jay just referenced. And then I think for advocates to continue to push the governor to renew it, because at this point, we don't see an end to this pandemic. We know unemployment rates are still incredibly high. And we also don't know the extension of unemployment benefits because the $600 FPUF payments expired um, on July 25th for Floridians. And at this point, there is no answer to if there will be extended benefits. And so obviously, living at $275 or less a week is just not possible right. in our state. Um, I think we all agree that the, the governor's order is smart. I mean, giving tenants this ability to prove that they have an income loss. What we also need is a statewide program, frankly, for those landlords who can't pay their mortgage and aren't covered by the federal protections. So extending that order, which is a, a well-written order, works. We are learning how to work with it, but also then providing some assistance so that we look at this problem holistically. This is not, this is not a small issue. Uh, Florida's got more than 40% of its renters at risk of eviction right now. We have a very high percentage of renters in the state, and we right. have a very high percentage of renters who use more than 30% of their income for their rent. I think Florida, Miami-Dade County has the highest number of census tracts in the country of renters that pay more than half their income in rent. So it isn't going away. Our economy is structured this way. And statewide solutions would be very helpful. Right, right. Well, and, and I am a renter myself. I have two roommates, including my twin sister. So um, not many lawmakers are renters. And so I, I think it helps to have lawmakers that can relate um, versus those that, um, you know, only have the perspective of property owners because it is, it's a growing population of renters ever since the 2008 recession. We've seen um, more and more individuals become renters. Um, and this next question, and it might be one of our last questions, so if there's a burning question, please put in the chat so we can pull it up because we're going to create space for closing remarks very soon. We're almost at the end of our hour together. Um, but this last question is another long-term question that we've kind of already spoken to, um, but we can be more specific. Um, so Christy writes, so thinking long-term, what can we as advocates do for low-income tenants once all this is lifted and they will be required to pay the back rent? So it is pay to play. I don't imagine a tenant will have the money to pay all the back rent. So, you know, just thinking about, about after this, ha after, after the moratorium either expires or maybe it, it is renewed, but you know, it hits a point where you still owe back pay. Um, what are some of the best advocacy goals that we can have to, to ensure these tenants are not going to continue to carry this burden and that landlords are not gonna get paid? I know locally the work that our United Way has done through the First Coast Relief Fund has seen landlords being willing, as long as the tenant and the landlord come forward together proactively and, and seek the assistance together, 
we have landlords accepting 20, 30%, 40% of the back rent. So the funds are out there, the CARES Act money and other resources are being pooled. If tenants are proactive and landlords pro are proactive and they do it now in August, right? Yes. While we have this temporarily cessation, then make a head run. Uh, don't wait until September 1st to see what happens. Yeah, I think uh, to Jim's point, uh, it's going to take either agreement between both the parties to make that debt go away, but it's also going to take money. So we've got to, you know, landlords have to be compensated. It's a valid debt. There's no legislation that changes that or relieves them a tenant of the burden of paying it or the responsibility for it. So long term, we need financial workouts like Jim talked about between landlord and tenant and some agencies, relief agencies, um, they're going to have to have funding from some source right. to help both sides. Right. Yeah, I don't, I don't, besides what was said, I don't have a very, very great uh, answers for that. I, I mean, we have used bankruptcy in very limited instances where people who live in public housing or if there's a mobile home park or, or instance where a chapter seven or a chapter 13 bankruptcy might work. Uh, uh, that's been something we've pursued, but there aren't a lot of, there aren't a lot of um, legal remedies beyond that. One yeah. of the pitfalls is also, you've got an eviction on your record. You know, let's say it's next year, you've gotten past the eviction. You're looking for another place. Um, you have that eviction on your record, but you're also entered into a database that says you're a bad tenant that owes your last landlord money. Um, right. That's going to be a like a hidden hurdle that folks may or may not even know about, but they're just going to, you know, face that hurdle in securing housing later in um, life. I think that, you know, going forward, this is not going to be over in the next year or four because the landlord could always sue on the debt or turn it over to a collection agency. So the problem is not going to go away unless there's, you know, some creative resolution we come up with. Right. Well, and I, I definitely want to give a shout out to um, United Way and 211 Lines. I know that they are working overtime and trying to provide resources to folks. And, you know, most of our conversation today is focused on uh, tenants and, and leases, but we also know we have a community of Floridians who live in hotels and motels um, that are, are struggling in similar, but also different <clears throat> ways. And of course, just our homelessness population as a whole with very little resources. So um, we definitely need more funding. We need, we need CARES Act dollars and, and hopefully more relief dollars to just meet the demands of tenants and landlords and to help folks reset. And if anyone's ever read the book Evicted, um, it's a fantastic book that really gives the perspective of both landlords and tenants in low income communities. And it, it really just provides insight to how, how damaging evictions are to someone's long term health and sustainability in society as well. Um, and so with that said, we are near the end of our hour. I was wondering if each one of you wanted to maybe just give closing remarks, sharing any content information. And for folks that are wondering, uh, we were able to get this live on YouTube. It looks like Facebook gave us some issues, but we're going to post this whole video on our Facebook page so folks can watch it later as well. Um, but maybe, um, Jay, I can throw it to you for some quick closing remarks and then um, we'll take it from there. Sure. Um, I think if you take nothing away from this, you should immediately start gathering your documents if you're COVID impacted, because believe me, five days is not a long time to respond. Um, you are gonna get served if you're in that situation, so be prepared, start now. Um, secondly, if you're in Orange County, reach out to Legal Aid, you can call us. We're working remotely, but we're at 100% or more than 100% because we're working with volunteer attorneys right now. So we have the capacity to talk to you about your individual situation. So reach out to us. Um, we'll, we can share the number. Uh, just be proactive. Don't ignore it. It's not going to go away. If you're not prepared and you get in front of the judge, even if you had a good defense and you don't have those documents, you're not going to be able to prove it. So take charge of your own situation. Thank you, Jay. 
I, I, I just want to thank you for putting this together and giving us this opportunity. Uh, we appreciate it. It helps us get the word out to our clients. We are all in this together. Uh, we had the fortunate experience of having Matt Desmond come down to Jacksonville last year and talk to us about housing issues. And his eviction lab is tracking Jacksonville as one of the cities uh, hit by this, uh, whatever's going to happen next. So part of the reason why we're all in this together is because our economy is based on our tourism base and a lot of those folks are renters and we've got to come up with these solutions as a state so that we can continue not paying state income taxes, which is, which is a great reason to live here. So thank you again for putting this together and for coordinating all of this and giving us this opportunity to speak to our constituents here in Florida. Thanks, Jim. Sean? Okay, just wrap it up very quickly by saying thank you so much for having us. And I think the, the most important takeaway is to, if you're in the situation, reach out and seek legal assistance. I did just, uh, a lot of really great websites have been discussed during this um, discussion. I did just um, put our Legal Services of Greater Miami's website uh, in, into the chat. So feel, please visit our website, uh, reach out to us. We have a lot of good information there. Um, in addition to the other things that have been discussed and just Thank you very much for, for having us. Awesome. Thank you, Jay, Sean, and Jim for take, taking the time out of your incredibly busy schedules uh, to be with us today. I know that everything you've shared has been so impactful, a little sombering, but um, hopefully also empowering because Floridians know that that they have an opportunity to protect themselves. They have to plan ahead. Um, none of this is ideal and trust me, I, I am fighting every day for policy changes that can make this work uh, not only more transparent, but more accessible. And of course, even the playing field, um, whether there's a crisis or not, we know that tenants are always at risk. And it's so important for us to continue to do this work together. Um, I just want to remind folks that um, we are going to send an email after uh, we wrap up um, today's conversation that include the links that these gentlemen already spoke about. So you can have all those links in one place. Um, we're also going to get this video up onto our Facebook page and we'll share that recording with you as well. So you can share it with your networks and ensure that as many people as possible have access to this information. Um, I, I do appreciate our um, translators today as well. So for those who joined, with our Spanish and Creole line. Thank you for being a part of this conversation as well. Um, and we will definitely be here. You can contact my office at Anna.Escamani at myfloridahouse.gov. You can also just send us a message on, on Facebook. And um, please continue to keep in touch. Know that we're, we care about you and you have incredible resources around you, whether you're eligible for legal aid or not, um, these gentlemen share resources that, um, that you can build your own response to the court if necessary. So just know that there are, you should try to seek pro bono legal support if you can, but if that's not on the table for you, there are other tools available for free online that can also help you defend yourself and protect yourself uh, with the ultimate goal of making sure that folks are going to survive this pandemic, not, not see an increase in homelessness, um, and of course, stop the spread together. Um, so again, I thank each one of you for joining us. Thank you to the Florida Bar Foundation uh, for being such a great partner in this. And um, we're looking forward to many more opportunities to work together. Thank you again. Thanks so much. Thank you.